Hello, friends. Welcome to another episode of the Roto World Football Podcast. I'm Josh. That's Ian. Ian, how are we this midweek episode? Great, man. Double digit week 10 now. I uh, feel like we've got the best weeks ahead of us, though, still. Well, you, you really put underneath the tablecloth what really is meaningful, and that's the six teams on a bye. Yes. That's six fewer teams you have to worry about this week. Six Not this saying week. we dislike, you know, talking about every single team <laughs> each week, but whenever that happens midseason, we kind of enjoy it a little bit more. We got four buys next week, four buys the next, and then it's just a sprint to the end with all six teams. Maybe we'll actually finish my Sunday night review pod at like 1 a.m. instead of 1.30. <laughs> that would be nice. Uh, today's a loaded episode. There's a lot that has happened since you, me, and Daigle sat here on Monday evening. So much news since then, why don't we get into it? Why don't we start off, but first, with the Thursday night football preview. Um, it's a fun matchup. You know, Thursday night football's been pretty good this year. Uh, this one is the Los Angeles Chargers traveling to the Oakland Raiders. Chargers are one-point road favorites here, a total of 48 in this one. Ian, I feel like we know who these teams are, who their identities are, and hopefully we would after nine games for the Chargers, eight games for the Raiders. For the Raiders, it's a bad defense, efficient offense, Chargers, though, seem to be improving as the year goes along. I will say, I think we know who the Raiders are, but this Chargers offense is going to be a little bit different, I think, moving forward. We did see last week their first game with their quarterback coach now being their play caller, and the early returns were good. I, I think it's fair to not expect them to be as bad as they were those first four games with Melvin Gordon moving forward, but it was good to see them, you know, put up those points against the Packers like they did. I didn't really expect them to play that well, but credit to them. I think the one big takeaway from that, though, like Hunter Henry had 10 targets, and then Keenan, Mike, uh, Eckler, and Gordon all each only had four. Like, this is a crowded offense yeah. when everyone is healthy and ready to go, which we haven't really seen until the last few weeks once Hunter Henry got back. You know, Rap Sheet put out a tweet right after the trading deadline saying that some teams, I guess, viewed the Chargers as maybe a seller, but the Chargers didn't want any of that. They were very confident in their roster. They were very confident that this team could still compete as the year goes along. And they've kind of shown – I mean, Melvin Gordon is coming off his best game since returning 23 touches at 109 yards. He looked back. And two touchdowns. Um, the defense is getting healthier. Joey Bosa was fantastic. Yeah. Melvin Ingram, Dorwin James will come back hopefully at some point this season. Uh, on the other side, it's the Raiders, right? It's the Raiders where so many of us made John Gruden as the butt end of jokes as the summer and the season was coming around. And he's kind of thrown that in our face yeah. completely because this is a very po positively, I guess is the right term for it, coached offense and exactly what they want to do on the field, they are doing on the field. It's been beautiful. There's like at least three plays a game where you got to go back to it and like, whoa, that play design was actually awesome there. The only complaint that I can come up with with Gruden at this point is like Josh Jacobs' pass game usage. I mean, Jalen Richard has 17 targets. DeAndre Washington has 11. Josh Jacobs only has 15 I mean, when you have a running back who has the second most t broken tackles in the league behind only Chris Carson this season, like, yeah. keep giving that guy the ball. He's, he's getting fed mostly on the ground. You know, he's only one of nine running backs averaging at least 20 touches per game. But at the same time, like, I just want to see the best players in the league touch the ball more. But this is kind of a crowded offense, too, uh, low-key. We saw Zay Jones last week kind of force his way into three wide receiver sets uh, in place of Trevor Davis after they kind of got him acclimated to the new offense. But, you know, Tyrell Williams, Hunter Renfro, Darren Waller, yeah. all these guys have, like, 10 or 11 targets over the last two weeks because Derek Carr, also playing great this season, uh, has been spreading the ball out. I've talked about this on the review pod before, but where you can really see that Derek Carr and John Gruden are in sync is that Derek Carr hits his back foot and gets rid of the football immediately. You know, it's none of these plays where he's extending out of structure or trying to find comfort in chaos because we have years on Derek Carr. We know <laughs> that that's not his game at all, right? He, he wants to have pre-snap reads, post-snap reads, and get the football as quickly as possible. And even in those intermediate, even in those downfield throws, I mean, those are big gains that he is making. Tyra Williams is still involved in this offense despite him being kind of an out-of-structure wide receiver with the L.A. Chargers a few years ago. Um, I, I just don't know if we have seen enough from Derek Carr for him to certainly be the quarterback in 2020, but I think as this goes along, it would be a very, very difficult decision for John Gruden to move off of this quarterback who's making this offense, again, very efficient. He's been... Good, like you said. I mean, once things once things break down, he, he struggles. You know, when he's under pressure, right. it's bad. But there's a lot of quarterbacks like that. I mean, there's only – I mean, the Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jacksons of the world that can create off structure, you know, few and far between. If you have someone like a Derek Carr, like a Jared Goff, 
you know, it helps to be able to build around them. I will say, though, I think when you have this quarterback where you need to have all the pieces around them, being it's excellent, be, especially when they're on a franchise quarterback contract like this. It's one thing if they're on a rookie deal and you can actually surround them with great pieces, but a little bit harder when you're making over $100 million bucks. And that's not really a formula you want to try to replicate each and every year because the defense already sucks. Yeah. The defense is already one of the worst in the NFL. They can't rush the passer at all. I, I do want to give credit to Tom Cable, too, though, who's also been the butt end of jokes yeah. for many years, the offensive line coach, because the Raiders' offensive line is playing very well. Now, Rodney Hudson had some was out last week, and they had some issues up the middle. They've had injuries all season, really. They've had injuries all season, but they have invested in that offensive line. I mean, we know about Trent Brown. We know about Colton Miller at tackle. It's been coached well, and it helps Josh Jacobs plenty. The offense, though, can be whittled down to Derek Carr, Josh Jacobs, and Darren Waller, and that's a very, very fun trio. Josh Jacobs is one of the best rookies in the NFL. For sure. Absolutely. Uh, one quick thing before we move on. Mike Williams, 54 targets this season without a touchdown. That's the most in the league. I think he breaks it this week. Yeah, I can see it. I mean, these, are, again, are awful Raiders. <laughs> it's as good a matchup as any. If, if he doesn't happen, do it this right? week, when is he going to do Not it? Not exactly going on a limb there. But <laughs> that's such a twist on who we think Mike Williams is in that – because right. there were times when he was only a red zone threat, and that's about it. Like the touchdowns were stabilizing his numbers, and it's been the opposite. He's still so far making this year. a play every other game or two where, like, it's a contested catch downfield, and you see that true talent shine through. But yeah, like, if, I did not expect this to be a problem. I, we, we thought maybe the touchdown regression would come after he had double digit scores last season, you know, without too many targets. But to have zero and be that talented, surprising. Uh, that was the Thursday night preview. Again, we'll preview. All the other games, well, not all of them, nine other games uh, on the next podcast after this one that you will find in your subscription box, if that's the right t term for it, uh, on Friday. On Friday. Again, that's with Daigle. That's with Pat. That's with Hayden. All right, let's hit on some news. There's been a lot of news in the last couple of days. The first one is Nick Foles is taking over as the starting quarterback of the Jacksonville Jaguars after their bye this week. Um, that means Gardner Minshew now sits. Uh, they came out, the Jaguars did, Doug Marone did, and announced this about as early as they could. There had been rumors, murmurs, hints that this was going to be the decision. It seems like even for weeks. Um, but do you think more, Ian, I'll, I'll pose this question this way. Do you think more it's because Nick Foles, they just want to see how he's going to fare because they paid him so much money. Do you think yes, it's being yes. okay? <laughs> or do you think it's being upset with how Gardner Minshew has played lately? It has to be the former because look at Minshew four and four as a starter, 13 touchdowns, four picks, 12th in adjusted yards per attempt among 34 qualified quarterbacks. He's extended plays. Like we talk about guys that can create off script. Minshew is one of those guys. Like everything doesn't have to be right for him to break the pocket and create something downfield. And we've really seen that all year. Didn't help that he played one of his worst games last week, you know, with right. this decision kind of looming. But even then, I mean, it was more his turnovers were just kind of in comeback mode in the second half, like trying to do a little bit too much. Again, I think it's the 88 million reasons why they have a, a reason to uh, play Foles moving forward. But, again, it comes back to, like, I, I don't understand why they couldn't have flipped Foles to Chicago or Cincy or one of these other teams that isn't Just happy. now, already. Yeah, just do it because, again, just the difference of having that quarterback on a rookie contract and you can just spend a ton of money elsewhere, which they're going to have to do. Right. So, like what? You got rid of Jalen Ramsey because you didn't want to pay him. Who are you guys going to pay? Like I, it's it's interesting because they haven't even given Yannick Ngakwe another contract yet, and he's kind of the one who was up. Like you mentioned, it was a four-year deal initially for Nick Foles, but it can kind of be basically whittled down to a two-year contract. We've talked about this constantly because Gardner Minshew has been one of the biggest stories of 2019, that he changed the identity of this team. Sure, they're still giving Leonard Fournette 25 touches, but so many of those aren't just handoffs to the back end of Cam Robinson yeah. or the back end of A.J. Can. Like, these are a lot of times now uh, passes out of the backfield. I mean, I believe he leads the NFL running backs and routes runners close to it. Um, and it's also that you have a quarterback now who has comfort in chaos, who can take that extra moment. Do we truly believe that Nick Foles is going to be that same type of player? Do we think that he is going to be able, when everything is going wrong around him, to still have that same connection that Minshew had to DJ Chark? I don't know if we do. I do wonder how difficult it's going to be. And I don't think the Jaguars are going anywhere this year. I thought they could be frisky if they beat the Houston Texans this past weekend. But changing your identity midseason, I don't know how much is, but 
I think it's fair to ask how much of it is going to change. Yeah, and he's never been that type of quarterback. No. Even, you know, we can throw out his poorest Jeff Fisher year like we have for Jared Goff and these other quarterbacks. But even with that, like, he's always been this guy that I think, you know, he's going to hit his first, second, or third read from the pocket. And if those aren't there, well, we're in trouble. We saw him. I mean, the play he broke his collarbone on was uh, his kind of – It was a great throw. It was his patented teardrop uh, deep ball downfield, hit Chark right between the numbers. So, I mean, he can still make plays. They have an underrated receiving group, especially when D.D. Westbrook is healthy. But, again, this has not been just like the easiest offensive situation for Minshew to thrive no. in. Leonard Fournette putting up yards, but he's 36 out of 36 running backs in success, in success rate this season. Like, he's busting big plays after he gets like 10 carries that go for three yards or less. So – Again, having that quarterback that can create off script has been huge for them. And, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't really call Foles an upgrade at this point. Minshew did have a fumbling problem. He had seven fumbles in those first five games played. He did have nine touchdowns and interception those same five. Last four games, four fumbles, three interceptions, and four touchdowns. So the raw stats might show you that it's kind of been a decline for Gardner Minshew. I would say he had two rough games this season. And one was against the New Orleans Saints, who were one of the best defenses in the NFL. And then the other one was in London against the Houston Texans. And he did bounce back from the Saints game because we were asking afterwards, like, what's going to happen? Is he going to spiral out of control? And, you know, he's... And we talked about Foles being on a two-year, basically a four-year deal. Who knows which one it is or what, which one's going to be. I just cannot envision um, Gardner Minshew sitting for two years or sitting for four years, right? After everything that he's put out there already... Um, being this identity of the team, being one of the biggest stories, again, of the season, and how good he has been. Sure, some of it was completely demolishing whatever expectations were out there, but I don't know how you can not go back to this at some point if there is somewhat of a struggle. Like, I, I wonder how long that leash is, and I think because of how quickly the decision was made, the leash is going to be very long for Nick Foles. It seems like it, and I was wondering if maybe they're putting Foles out to try to get his trade value up before the offseason, but I think you could argue his trade value would be higher if they just didn't even play him the rest of the season and waited for the offseason. Yeah, I I think that's a fair comment to make. All right, more news on the quarterback front. Cam Newton is on injured reserve, uh, and it's with the Liz Frank injury that has basically kept him out since week three of the NFL season. That means Kyle Allen will almost certainly start the remainder of the year. There's so many directions that we could go here. Um, Look, Cam's injury was an injury that happened during the preseason. Um, He set out, I believe, the last two games of the preseason or the last week and a half of the preseason and then tried to play in the first two weeks. There were some really bright moments against the Rams. There were basically none against the Bucs. And so much of that seemed like it was a foot injury that Ron Rivera basically denied. Um, they asked him, if you remember back to that Thursday night football game, the, the loss against the Bucks when they were in that trick play at the goal line and asked Christian McCaffrey, you know, they asked Ron Rivera after the game, like, why not run Cam? Is it something about the foot? And he said, no, it's absolutely not the foot. All right. Now we know that a Liz Frank injury is basically a three to five month recovery. This is a quarterback that tried to play on that injury. It, with limited success, I will absolutely admit that. And since he has not had surgery, has gone to three different doctors, three different specialists, and they basically said, we don't know why this isn't healing, but it needs a lot more time to heal. This is after he finished the last month of last season with a shoulder injury that needed surgery that he had no business playing through. I mean, the slander on Cam over the last few weeks has just been brutal, especially when, like, look, credit to Kyle Allen for getting all the wins and all this, but... He's played really well against the Cardinals and the Buccaneers. He has been absolutely replaceable, I think, in every other game this season. Because it's not, I mean, I don't want to say it's not hard, but when you have Christian McCaffrey, Curtis Samuel, DJ Moore, three guys that can create at a very high level with the ball in their hands, you can be an average quarterback and look pretty good. Cam, unfortunately, couldn't be that because he was dealing with a three- to five-month foot injury he was trying to play through. I mean, we were talking before uh, earlier this season, about how we were, before the season started, we worried about Cam's shoulder and could he throw downfield. And our kind of conclusion was, hey, he might not be the same deep ball passer, but it doesn't matter. He's got all these great weapons around him for once. And, you know, it's unfortunate it hasn't worked out this way. I hope he hasn't played his final snap yeah. in Carolina because I still think he has a good football ahead of him. That's kind of where I want to take this discussion because it, it goes very deep because – Cam is under contract for the 2020 season. It's about $20 million, and 19 of it is unguaranteed. They'd basically lose $1 or $2 million for the 2020 season. And there, I mean, Joe Person 
is very connected to the Panthers. He's not one of these beat writers, though, that says, hey, I have heard this. Like, this is what's happening in the building. It's more so, like, when you can kind of pick up, and this goes for a lot of the, the Panthers beat writers, that you can kind of pick up on the tea leaves and what's going on just based on the comments they're making. And if, if I had to guess right now, based on the local reporters, it would be that Cam's not back with his team in 2020. Oh. And that would just be a monumental mistake. Because when you look at quarterback contracts across the league, and just for 2020 right now, Cam is expected that $20 million is the quarterback 14 salary. And that's without Dak Prescott getting paid, Drew Brees getting paid, Tom Brady getting paid. A lot of quarterbacks are going to make more money than that next year. It's not easy to find a quarterback in this league. And so if the Panthers decide that they can just move on with Cam, or without Cam, and don't get something substantial in return, it's a monumental failure. And I'm not sure if I believe in this organization enough for one, how they've handled Cam Newton the last three years, and two, how Marty Herney was the one who brought in names like Jimmy Clausen, Matt Moore, Brian St. Pierre, David Carr, and Vinny Testaverde as the quarterbacks prior to Cam Newton arriving in his lap at number, number one overall pick. And I know people have this idea with Cam that he's this run first quarterback that maybe can't operate out of the pocket as well as others. But I think a lot of that is just more narrating and not actually based on what we've seen. It's incredibly false. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Even over the last three seasons, like since the 2015 season, he has been running less than we saw, you know, during the first five or six seasons of his career. You know, yeah, he, maybe he's not going to be a guy anymore that can average 40 or 50 rushing yards per game, but I don't think he needs to to be an effective quarterback. Will we probably ever see 2015 Cam VP again? Probably not, but he can still play at a high level, I think, moving forward, even if he's not going to be this big-time rushing threat. And if I can be honest, like, this is one of those moments, like, if this really is the end for Cam, and I'm sure when that story comes along, we'll talk about it at length, but we're, we're, it makes you reflect on kind of like your football enjoyment and your football life, at least for me, because Cam made me love football even more. He made it more entertaining. And there aren't that many players across the league where you can say, wow, I rode the highs and lows of this guy's career and he made it more fun. And that is absolutely what Cam Newton has done. And he did it. His MVP season, when they went to the Super Bowl, it was Philly Brown, it was Ted Ginn, it was Jericho Cotchery, and it was a rookie year Devin Funches. The most disheartening part <laughs> of this entire conversation is that finally, this Panthers team has Christian McCaffrey, Curtis Samuel, DJ Moore, legitimate NFL weapons, and now Cam Newton cannot stay healthy. That, to me, again, is heartbreaking because something magical could be happening right now, and it's just not for a variety of reasons. Cam in 2015, I think, was the most single dominant performance season long that I've seen from an individual player at the NFL level. And how about, like, just real quick, that Auburn season, national championship. Oh, dude, when he was single-handedly here are, here beating Alabama. Yes. Here are the top receivers from that Auburn team. Terrell Zachary, Darvin Adams, Who, Emery Blake, yep. and Philip Lutzkirchen. Like, come on. Yep. <laughs> Phil Lutzenkirchen. Uh, Darvin Adams actually got a tryout with the Panthers because of Cam Newton. They actually drafted his left tackle, Lee Ziemba, in the seventh round because, most likely, of Cam Newton. Look, Kyle Allen is a restricted free agent, right? And I don't know how you can go into the 2020 season and be like, yeah, we're good with Kyle Allen. This team wasn't even good with Kyle Allen prior to the season. That's why they drafted Will Greer with the number one overall, 100 overall selection. Um, I'm, I'm acting like Cam Newton is not only out with the Panthers, but is like out of the league and he's retired. I, I don't mean to be jumping that far, right? But I am nervous just reading the TDs right now if he's not a member of the squad. And if, and if he's not a member of the Panthers, there should be teams lined up to get him. And they will pay much more than that $20 million. I mean, that $20 million is basically what Nick Foles is getting paid this year. It's basically what Joe Flacco is getting paid this year. You take a risk on a player who, I'm not going to say is a Hall of Famer, but has the record for most rushing touchdowns by a quarterback in NFL history. Change the position was truly influential at the position. And I think that there would be five, six, seven teams that should give something substantial, but the Panthers are like, hey, we're just going to cut you and save this $20 million? Ludicrous. Yeah, I'm already rolling my eyes at the off-field reports, off-season reports that are going to come in saying, Cam, oh, worried about 
off the field issues and his off field issues are pretty much being a sore loser which like who isn't a sore loser like you should want to win I hate it when guys like Cam Newton and Odell Beckham Jr. are chastised for you know these being quote, individuals exactly and yeah. just caring about winning and stuff like show me show me something that guy has actually done wrong that has like impacted someone negatively and you know maybe we can have a conversation but guy's been awesome in the community he's been an awesome quarterback for years and again just to see kind of the way his name's been run through the mud already a little bit in the last 12 months has been super disappointing yeah as Darren Gantz says Cam Newton makes people stupid just because of the comments that people have in reaction to him yes, um, yes. and and I firmly believe it well Again, this will be a much bigger story. And who knows if Marty Herney's there? Who knows if Ron Rivera is there based on how this season ends up? Um, I, it would be an absolute shame if Cam Newton is not a member of the Panthers in 2020. All right, let's keep it going now with one of Ian's 17 columns each week. Uh, typically, we've done backfields. Let's now focus on the cornerback and wide receivers. You know, a lot of people view these wide receivers when they look in their fantasy lineups and say, Ooh, he's matching up against this great defense with this great corner. Well, Ian, as you've talked about a lot, a lot of these corners don't shadow. They don't trail wide receivers. Today we're going to focus on three or four that are going to trail wide receivers this Sunday, this weekend. And why don't we start off with the Cleveland Browns and the Buffalo Bills, namely Odell Beckham and Trey White, the cornerback for the Bills. Yeah, and real quick, just at a high level, like none, even a shadow matchup, it's not going to be 100% snaps during a game. But I think wide receiver cornerback matchups are the, from an offensive defense matchup perspective, we can put the most stock in these because there's more routes and coverage snaps than any other occurrence on the football field. If you look at rush attempts or, you know, quarterbacks, dropbacks, like we just have more data of on a per route basis than any other uh, category pretty much. But, okay, OBJ versus Travis White. So, Tredavious White, one of the league's best young cornerbacks, pretty much the latest LSU star to be balling out at the NFL level, top 10 in quarterback rating allowed, fantasy points allowed per cover snap. Guy's a baller, if you don't know. If the, if the viewers at home and listeners don't know who he is yet, you should. And surprisingly, the Bills weren't using him as the number one cornerback uh, to start the season. They faced yeah. Robbie Anderson, Tyler Boyd, Josh Gordon, Edelman, Corey Davis, Brown, Devontae Parker, Alshon Jeffrey. Didn't shadow. That changed last week when they faced Terry McLaurin, which, hey, that's a pretty nice uh, feather in the hat, I think, for uh, McLaurin F1. But now I'm expecting them to go ahead and do that again against Odell Beckham Jr. So we aren't certain of this, though, right? Like the coaching staff hasn't come out and said, hey, Trey White is going to shadow the opposing team's top wide receiver. It might have happened against the Redskins because Terry McLaurin might be the only wide receiver that you <laughs> worry about. While the Browns have not been good, Jarvis Landry is still getting run. They've thrown to Antonio Callaway quite a bit, especially this past weekend. Um, it would make sense, though, if a top corner is comfortable in moving to the right side and the left side, because a lot of times they stick to those sides, right? If, if he is, then, yeah, have him shadow Odell Beckham. Um, and we'll talk about Odell a little bit later on with Nick Menzio. But to me, what so much of his production is dictated on right now is just Baker Mayfield playing poorly. And, yeah, it's that and it's just volume because, look, he can win this matchup. He can win the matchup against any cornerback in the league. But if For he's sure. not getting the targets to do so, it's going to be an issue. But to your uh, earlier point, no, there's maybe five instances like a season where we can confirm there's going to be a shadow matchup through the coach or maybe the player says he's going to travel with a guy. Uh, this spot, though, I mean, Tredavious White, he does not move into the slot, so he's not going to be on there with Jarvis. So cool. that's why so I'm pretty confident sense. with uh, OBJ. But, yeah, real quick, just on the volume, man, it is – 8.4 targets per game this season for Beckham. He was never even below 10 with the Giants, yeah. so it's, it's been a tragedy. Again, he'll be one of the starts and sits we talk with Nick Menzio about later on. Let's now go to the Buccaneers and Cardinals. Uh, this is Mike Evans, possibly versus Patrick Pearson. We know Patrick Pearson missed six games this season. What has it been like for Patrick Pearson since coming back into the league? Uh, very bad, okay. actually. He's had two shadow matchups. Emmanuel Sanders went for seven catches, 112 yards. And a score, Michael Thomas went for 11 catches, 112 yards, and a score. And Peterson's shadow coverage, he's still not moving to the slot a ton, so if the Buccaneers feel the need to free up Evans, they can do so. But he did shadow Evans in their two previous career matchups. Did mm. fairly well. I mean, this is, you know, Peterson 6'2", 220, I think he is. Like, he is one of the bigger cornerbacks in the league that can feasibly give someone like Mike Evans problems. That's why we've seen James Bradbury ha have so much success against him over the years. But with that said, Evans, overall wide receiver, too, this season. Like, you talk about matchup-proof wow. receivers. It's Mike Evans. It's Chris Goblin. I will say, you know, we talked about on our Sunday show about how Evans and Goblin haven't necessarily been balling out the same weeks uh, this season. They have been top 10 wide PPR wide receivers in two games, top 24 and three. 
I think this is a spot against the Cardinals who, you know, I mean, Goblin's going to be in the slot against uh, Tremaine Brock. Both Goblin and Evans can be wide receiver once this week. Yeah, and they have been at times this season. Yeah. Both are just ridiculous talents. Both are on pace, I think, for over like 1,300 yards this season. Just incredible, the talent that they have at wide receiver. The one thing Jameis has absolutely done right this season. Yes, <laughs> and then he makes about five mistakes in a row when he does not throw the football to them. Before we move on to the last matchup, I do want to reiterate that right now, if you need just a little extra boost in your fantasy football season, go and check out rotoworld.com slash win or rotoworld.com slash DFS for our premium products. You use promo code NFL50 for 50% off both. Again, that's DFS at rotoworld.com slash DFS or rotoworld.com slash win for the season pass. All right, the Falcons and Saints. Again, another team, the Falcons, that have two very good wide receivers. Um, you know, we talked about good corners, best corners, matching up with the opposing best wide receiver. Well, we've also seen exposures where that doesn't happen, where instead a team uses a corner and a safety help on the best receiver and then isolates, in this case, Marshawn Lattimore against a secondary wide receiver in Calvin Ridley. Yeah, so that's what it looks like they're going to be doing because last year, week three, Calvin Ridley's basically coming out party was that three-touchdown performance um, against the Saints, and it was so bad that they moved Lattimore mid-game off of Julio and on the Ridley, and then they turned around in week 12, and they did that for the entire game. I mean, I went back and watched all of Julio's, like, 14 targets from that week 12 matchup, and Eli Apple was consistently tracking Julio man-to-man, but every single time, I mean, there was a safety, usually Marcus Williams, you know, just waiting uh, for him, giving him help over the top. So when you have that safety help over the top, it's so much easier for cornerbacks. People try to jump those slants, jump those crossers, make things difficult, which means Lattimore was on a complete island against Calvin Ridley, which that's not an easy thing to do. And I think, you know, we saw that, hey, this is how they played him last year, but doesn't necessarily mean that it was all successful. In that um, Week 12 matchup, Julio went for 11 catches, 147 yards. Eli, um, And then um, Ridley had, let's see, eight catches, 93 yards, and a score. Both these guys are so talented, and especially now that Mohamed Sanu is out of the picture. We have a little bit more target share guarantee for Ridley. I wouldn't really downgrade any matchup, but is it, it is interesting to see how they have bracketed Julio in the past. And we do believe that Matt Ryan is going to play in this game. So that obviously elevates, even though Matt Schaub did decently well in his spot start. Captain um, mop up. <laughs> that still allows us to have exposure to the Falcons offense because despite them being absolutely awful this year, the offense still has put up points and put up yards. Yes. Again, you can check out Ian's cornerback and wide receiver matchups column up on Rotoworld. Now it's time to bring on Nicholas Menzio for his starts and sits every week. One of the most red columns each week on Roto World. People love Nick's starts and sits, and so do we. That's why we bring him on the show. And Nick, we kind of all love Kenyon Drake right now. After his spot start duty, after being traded from the Dolphins to the Cardinals, now, that again, that was 15 carries, 110 yards, and a touchdown, four catches for 52 yards in his last contest. Nick, you want to start him against the Tampa Bay Bucks, despite the Bucks' run defense having its moments this year. Yeah, Drake toasted the town right now. Uh, played 84% of the snaps last week in his Cardinals debut. Turned him into 19 touches, 167 yards, and one score, like you mentioned. Uh, it was his first 100-yard rushing game since week 14 of 2017. I mean, finally released from the grips of that Dolphins situation that was just suffocating in the middle. It was, it was nice to see his playmaking ability out there again. Um, of course, David Johnson and Chase Edmonds missed that game. Edmonds is out for extended time. Johnson should be back this week, uh, but... I don't, I don't see him taking over workhorse duties at any point again this year. I mean, he's been too, been too banged up. Uh, Drake was good enough last week that I could see him getting 8 to 12 touches at minimum this week against the Bucs. Um, like you said, their run defense is number one in DVOA and number one in rushing yards allowed. But Coach, Cl- Coach Cliff King- Kingsbury's offense does a great job spreading, this, spreading defenses out with four wide sets, uh, getting the ball in the hands of his running backs, either passing the ball to them or handing it off. Um, they don't see stacked boxes because of because of those four wide sets. So, I think this is just a spot to get get Drake involved more. Um, we've got six teams on by. I think he's on the back end of the RB two radar this week. Yeah, Nick. You know, I feel like we've all been really excited about this Kingsbury offense all off season in the early parts of the year, looking to see what wide receivers can ball out. But it's been the running game that's been the kind of pleasant surprise. I mean, one of three offenses averaging at least 2.5 yards before contact. So, you know, a lot of credit to Kingsbury for the way he's been scheming things up. Maybe it does make sense to invest more in the running backs in this offense and the wide receivers moving forward. 
Yeah, we, we and like and every, I agree with everything you mentioned. And we have a fifty-one point total in this game, second highest mm-hmm. of the week. Um, both teams are bottom nine in opponent plays per game on the defensive side, so we should see a, a ton of volume in this spot. Um, not to put you both on the spot, but that's my job here. Uh, it kind of sounds like we're going to get David Johnson maybe after week ten, not necessarily or week not uh, week ten. Should be here week ten. So okay, then what about when Chase Edmond comes back? Like, I guess my, my question is this: What happens? when the entire backfield is healthy. How are we going to sort through that mess? Because right now, this is great. We can start Kenyon Drake and feel comfortable with it. But Nick, do you have any read on this situation? I I mean, is Edmonds going to come back? I mean, this sounds like a a pretty serious hamstring pull. I could just see them if Drake continues to put big games on the board. I could see them just like putting Edmonds on IR. I don't know. I mean, And then what about David Johnson? Yeah, I mean, I don't don't see him ever becoming a workhorse type one, like, clear cut one number one back again this Mm. season but I I just expect one of these guys to be involved pretty pretty heavily moving forward behind him yeah and uh let's see week six I mean week five and six even before we actually saw David Johnson start to miss time he even looked labored then and we did Mm -hmm. see his snap rate kind of get that 60 70 percent range whereas earlier in the season he was really every down roll all right let's stick to this game Nick because you also want to talk about Ronald Jones Um, Last time he was on the field, Ronald Jones had 18 carries, 67 yards, and a touchdown. It's only been votes of confidence for Bruce Arians from Bruce Arians since then, basically saying that Ronald Jones has earned this starting gig, and Peyton Barber is basically playing right bench right now. Yeah, like you mentioned, 18 carries last week for 67 yards, a score, also caught two two balls in the passing game. It was his second 20-touch game of the season. Played a season high 55.3% of the snaps. Um, uh, Bruce Arians came out after that game and said uh, Jones has earned the right to start and play more snaps moving forward. Peyton Barber played a season low 11.8% of the snaps last week. Was essentially eliminated from the backfield. Dario Gumbawale, um, I expect to maintain his two-minute and catch-up mode roles in this offense, but he isn't a threat for carries really. He has exactly one carry in each of the last five games. Vultured a one-yard touchdown last week, but... That's not going to be the case moving forward. I mean, as I mentioned in the in the Drake thing, this 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 game has a 51 point total, second highest on the board. Two defenses that allow a ton of plays. Um, the Bucks are number three in offensive plays per game. The Cardinals are number one in pace. I mean, any if you have any Bucks and Cardinals players, I mean, you're going to want to put these guys in lineups this week, especially with six teams on by. Yeah, Nick, uh, we've talked about what Aaron said, and I think sometimes we do run into trouble with coach speak when an offensive coordinator says, yeah, we'd love to get our number two or number three running back more involved moving forward. I tend to trust Arians more than most other coaches because before a season, he said it's going to be a hot hand approach in this backfield. That's exactly what happened. Uh, you know, you, we, we've been on the news grind for, you know, all, all these years, even dating back to his Arizona days. Does it seem like Bruce Arians is one of these coaches that we can trust more at his word mm. than others? Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, what he says, I, I take take with far more weight than most coaches out there. Okay. Now let's go to a player that Ian and I discussed earlier in the show, um, basically because Odell could be seeing a lot of Trey White here. Um, you might have the same reasoning for this because, Nick, you have him as a sit this week. That's Odell Beckham. After six targets, five catches, 87 yards against the Denver Broncos last week. Yeah, Tredavious White plays a huge plays plays a huge role in this sit for me. But Beckham is the overall wide receiver, forty one and half PPR fantasy points per game this season. So he's not even returning wide receiver three value right now. I mean, it feels weird to suggest him as a flat out sit in fantasy, but after being drafted as a first or second round pick in the summer, but production just hasn't been there. He has two one hundred yard games, just one touchdown, zero since week two, four red zone targets, tied for ninety first in the league, and tied with Damian Ratley and Demetrius Harris on the team. So I mean. They're not getting the ball to him in the scoring area. Um, he's not scoring touchdowns. He's, I mean, the only thing that he's getting is, like, he's 16th in the NFL in targets per game at 8.4, but the Bills are number five in pass defense, DBOA, number eight in opponent plays per game. Uh, only the Patriots have allowed fewer fancy points to wideouts. Um, Tredavious White has a 49.8 passer rating in his coverage. This season has allowed zero touchdowns while picking off three passes. Only four cornerbacks among 115 qualifiers at Pro Football Focus have allowed a, a lower pass rating in their coverage. I mean, nothing's stacking up for OBJ this week. This 40-point total is the easily the lowest of the week. So, I mean, you're sparring OBJ at your own risk right now. And his quarterback is playing like doo-doo. So, that's a <laughs> big part of it as well. All right, let's close out on a name we haven't talked about at all this season. That's A.J. Green. Because A.J. Green could be returning to the field. 
this weekend. And it's no, it's not his draft mate in Andy Dalton throwing him the football. We, if we remember, and it, it's kind of not big news because it's the Bengals, but Ryan Finley <laughs> is a starting quarterback now for the Bengals. So, Nick, how do you view A.J. Green possibly in his debut against the Baltimore Ravens, a secondary that has really improved as the season has gone along? Yeah, I mean, I'm expecting him to play this week. They're coming off their bye. He was practicing before the bye week. Um, it'll be great to see him on the field, field again, but, I mean, I don't expect A.J. Green to play full complement of snaps. I maybe expect him to play 50% of the snaps. Um, he's now saddled with 25-year-old Ryan Finley at quarterback, making his NFL debut against the Ravens, who are their 22nd in fantasy points, a lot of wideouts, wide but that was before they got Marcus Peters from the Rams, before Jimmy Smith came back from a multi-week injury last week against the Patriots when they held Tom Brady to 6.2 yards per attempt and just one touchdown on 46 throws in that easy 17-point win. Um, this defense is number two in opponent plays per game. The Bengals ran a season low, 59 plays against them in week six when these two teams met up. Um, Cincinnati's implied team total of 17.5 points is second lowest on the board. I mean, I'm taking a wait-and-see approach for Ryan Green, and I, mean, I want to see him get a game or two under his belt. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm not the biggest Ryan Finley film watcher in the world by any stretch, but with that <laughs> said, I mean, in the preseason, only Finley, Mike Glennon, Ryan Griffin, and Nathan Peterman had a deep ball rate under 7%. Seems like this could be one of those kind of token backup quarterbacks that's going to check down. Is there anyone in this Bengals offense you nope. want exposure to in the near nope. future? None. <laughs> Zero. I, mean, I, I, I wouldn't mind Tyler Boyd in this game, but he's drawing Marlon Humphrey in the slot, too. So, I mean, yeah, enjoy that. To, yeah, I mean, going to be <laughs> on his volume here. So, I mean, it's not exciting. Yeah, just overall, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about this game while we might not because the Bengals are involved in the preview episode. But, um, you know, we talked about this Ravens defense not really being respectable compared to previous years. But what they've really done, and it makes sense, as seasons go along, different areas starting to form and gel and improve. And it really has been the secondary for the Ravens. So it might be. I mean, there's plenty of talent there. It might be one that, not to avoid as we go along, but one to make note of as we go along. All right, those are just four names in Nick Minzio's start sit. Come go and check out the rest of them. It's up on Roto World right now. Again, that's Ian. My name is Josh. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We'll be back later on this week with our preview extravaganza. And we'll be back Sunday, Roto World Live, noon Eastern, twitch.tv slash Roto World, where Patrick Darty will be in the house. Yay! See ya. Bye, everyone.